Welcome to Five Books for Catholics. When expert selects and explains five outstanding books on some aspect of Catholic life, doctrine or culture. Holy Week should be, in so far as possible, a time of recollection and prayer. To this end, reading one or other of the following books may be useful. It may help us enter more deeply into the mysteries we are celebrating and contemplating. For further recommendations, you can also check out last year's list. The link to it and the books recommended in this episode are in the show notes. The books recommended for this year are, first, Commentary on St John the Apostle and Evangelist, Homilies 48-88 by St. John Chrysostom. Second, What is Redemption? by Philippe de la Trinité. Third, Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist, Unlocking the Secrets of the Last Supper by Brandt Peter. Fourth, The Crucifixion in Irish Art by Peter Harbison. And fifth, a CD rather than a book, Thomas Tallis's The Complete English Anthems by the Tallis Scholars, directed by Peter Phillips. The first book on the list of recommended books for Lent was by a father of the church. We should look to the fathers because they are distinguished witnesses to the apostolic tradition. Moreover, in their preaching, they often convey the original meaning of a liturgical feasts and seasons. Consequently, their preaching on the Passion of Christ can be especially illuminating when it comes to the mystery of Holy Week. This year's patristic reading for Lent was St. John Chrysostom's homilies on repentance and almsgiving. This father and doctor of the Church can also guide us through Holy Week with these homilies on the Gospel of John. St John Chrysostom delivered them as a presbyter in his native Antioch around 390 AD. Not only was he a native of Antioch, his preaching also reflects that ancient church's approach to biblical exegesis. According to some scholars, early Antiochian Christianity stressed the literal sense of scripture whereas the Alexandrians focus more on the spiritual sense. Certainly St John's preaching is often direct and to the point. Moreover, he takes every opportunity to underline the practical implications of the gospel for one's own life. Nevertheless, he too is attuned to the spiritual sense of scripture and draws it out opportunely. In his homilies on John, Chrysostom explains the significance of the crucified Lord's pierced side and anticipates a later work of his, that is recited during the Office of Readings on Good Friday, his Baptismal Catechesis No. 3, Numbers 13 to 19. In the passage from his Homilies of John, where he comments on the same passage from the Gospel, he says the following. An ineffable mystery was also accomplished, for there came out blood and water, It was not accidental by chance that these streams came forth, but because the Church has been established from both of these. Her members know this since they have come to birth by water and are nourished by flesh and blood. The mysteries have their source from there, so that when you approach the awesome chalice, you may come as if you were about to drink from his very side. End of the quotation. Homilies 66 to 72 cover the events from Palm Sunday up to Holy Thursday, including Christ's farewell discourse, whereas homilies 83 to 85 cover the Passion. The preaching of St. John Chrysostom is often characterised as more catechetical, practical and less speculative than that of other Greek fathers of the period. Nevertheless, as some have noted, his homilies on John are more polemical than his sermons on the other books of the New Testament. 
In his homilies on John, he often inveighs against Arians and Anomanes. These two heretical groups had arisen in the 4th century and had become widespread. They denied the consubstantiality of the Son and the Spirit with the Father. St John Chrysostom takes advantage of every opportunity the Gospel provides to address their doctrinal errors and misreading of Scripture. This is a salutary reminder that the Trinity and its works are at the centre of all Christian preaching and worship, particularly during Holy Week. During the Sacred Triduum, we celebrate Christ's Passion, Death and Resurrection. However, these are not just events in the life of Jesus. They are works of the Trinity. The creation of Christ's human nature is a joint action of the three divine persons. The Father has sent the Son into the world, and Mary conceives the incarnate word by the Holy Spirit, whereas Jesus offers himself up to the Father for our salvation and to merit for us the gift of the Holy Spirit. Moreover, as we meditate upon these mysteries during Holy Week, we try to make sense of Scripture's various descriptions of Christ's passion, death and descent into hell. Some of the Bible's statements may sound strange to us and leave us not sure what to think. What did Jesus mean as he hung upon the cross and cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Or, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, how could the Father make the crucified Jesus to be sin? These are questions that we might raise in prayer with Christ, especially during Holy Week, when we contemplate the Paschal mystery and hope to grasp its significance. We can find authoritative and reliable answers to these questions in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Nevertheless, we might still feel that we have not understood them sufficiently. The Carmelite Philippe de la Trinité's recently reissued What is Redemption is a clear, penetrating explanation of some of these questions. The book aims to correct a common misconception of Christ's passion. This doctrinal distortion of the redemption and radical error as Philippe de la Trinité calls them, is that Jesus suffered on the cross in order to satisfy retributive justice. This misconception has crept in since the Reformation. The opening chapter sets out the evidence of how it is filtered into the Catholic imagination. It arrays a series of texts, mainly from French post-Reformation Catholic spiritual writers, that describe Christ's death on the cross as a penal substitution meant to satisfy the Father's wrath. Some authors even claim that Jesus suffered the torments of hell. However, Father Philippe de la Trinité insists that, and here I quote him, the Father did not exercise punitive justice on the Son. He was not therefore angry with them, and the Son himself had no sense of his own damnation. End of the quotation. The rest of the book sets out the more authentic doctrine of our redemption. It examines the biblical teachings, mainly under the guidance of St. Thomas Aquinas. The central contention is that Christ, the incarnate word, redeems us through his vicarious satisfaction and the merits of his charity. By elucidating how Christ has brought about our redemption, this book allows us to better understand the Paschal mystery. On Holy Thursday, Jesus institutes the Eucharist. He does so by eating the Passover Seder with his disciples and telling them to celebrate in a new way, in remembrance of him. He transforms the Passover Seder by linking it to his death on the cross. The Eucharist is just as much a constituent of the Paschal mystery as Christ's passion, death and resurrection. For this reason, one of last year's recommended books for Holy Week was Scott Hand's The Fourth Cup, unveiling the mystery of the Last Supper and the Cross. 
Another informative explanation of the biblical teaching on the Eucharist is Brant Petrie's Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist, Unlocking the Secrets of the Last Supper. This book is an abridgment of his more scholarly volume on the subject, Jesus and the Last Supper. In the introduction, Petra declares that my goal is to explain how a first century Jew like Jesus, Paul, or any of the apostles could go from believing that drinking any blood, much less blood, was an abomination before God, to believing that drinking the blood of Jesus was actually necessary for Christians. End of the quotation. To resolve this conundrum, not only does Petrie carefully elucidate the Old Testament events and institutions that Jesus brings to fulfilment in the Eucharist, such as the Exodus, the Passover, the manna, and the bread of the presence, he also looks to the extra-biblical sources on Second Temple Judaism and considers how Jesus' Jewish contemporaries would have understood these Old Testament events and expected the Messiah to bring them to fulfilment. Petra clarifies Christ's institution of the Eucharist by setting it within the milieu of Second Temple Judaism. Moreover, like Han, he argues that Jesus did not complete the Passover Seder on Holy Thursday, but on Good Friday, when, by accepting the wine offered to him in his dying moments, he drinks the last of the four ritually prescribed cups. So, Peter says, by waiting to drink the fourth cup of the Passover until the very moment of his death, Jesus united the Last Supper to his death on the cross. By refusing to drink of the fruit of the vine until he gave up his final breath, he joined the offering of himself under the form of bread and wine to the offering of himself on Calvary. In short, by means of the Last Supper, Jesus transformed the cross into a Passover. And by means of the cross, he transformed the Last Supper into a sacrifice. End of the quotation. Petrus is another book that can furnish us with a better understanding of what is going on during the Sacred Trudum. In the liturgy, we do not just listen to the word of God, but also worship God through sacred images. For more on the place of sacred images in Christian worship, read the interviews on icons and on sacred art. Indeed, one of the high points of Holy Week is the adoration of the Holy Cross during the celebration of the Lord's Passion on Good Friday. Likely, that will not be the only moment when we pray before a cross during Holy Week, whether at church or at home. Moreover, we may choose to pray before one cross rather than another, not just for convenience, but because it aids our prayer more. Maybe under other circumstances we have found another cross, very different in style, more helpful. The immense stylistic variety of crosses is a testimony to what St. Paul calls the unsearchable riches of Christ. This variety and the unconfinable significance of the cross is still apparent within the sacred art of a single country, such as Ireland. One book which illustrates this point is Peter Harbison's The Crucifixion in Irish Art, 50 selected examples from the 9th to the 20th century. Each entry has a page that explains the selected example and a black and white photo of it. The crosses surveyed range from tombstones to illuminated manuscripts, from church doors to stained glass windows. Many are not the most beautiful representations that there are. However, taken together, they reflect how deeply people have meditated on the cross over the centuries, amid varying social and cultural conditions, and aware of the cosmic import of Christ's death and the cross, have sought to make it ever-present in the world around us. 
Even if you do not find an image of the cross which you want to pray before, iconography surveyed will make you think more deeply about the mystery and significance of the cross. Music also plays a prominent role during the Liturgy of Holy Week. It summons us to meditate upon certain verses of scripture or prayers and make them our own. It expresses the emotions implicit in the text and rouses them within us. Listening to some of that music outside the liturgy can help us meditate upon the mysteries of Holy Week. Last week's interview surveyed two such pieces, Bach's St. John Passion and St. Matthew Passion. The former was first performed 300 years ago on Good Friday. Bach wrote his passions for the Lutheran liturgy in Leipzig. Almost 200 years earlier, Thomas Tallis, who lived from 1505 to 1585, was composing some of the first English anthems for the Anglican liturgy. Thomas Tallis was a gentleman of the Chapel Royal from 1543 until his death. In that role, he served four English monarchs, from Henry VIII to Elizabeth I, right during the thick of the Reformation. Moreover, his role was not limited to that of a chorister. He would have played the organ and directed the choir too. Most importantly, he was a composer. Thales and his protégé, William Byrd, served Anglican monarchs, and wrote music for the services of the recently established Church of England. To their credit, they remained Catholics. The clergy of the recently established Church of England had definite ideas about sacred music. As Peter Phillips has noted, they were looking for intelligibility and clarity in the word setting, which involved singing in English and keeping the musical style simple. End of the quotation. Thales's English anthems are an interesting example of music that he wrote to meet these demands. Philip says that, despite the dogmatic restrictions on the musical elaboration, they maintain a high artistic standard. Two of Thales's anthems, If Ye Love Me and A New Commandment, are perfect for Holy Week. They are settings of verses from Christ's farewell discourse to the Apostles on Holy Thursday. The evening Mass of the Lord's Supper commemorates not only Christ's institution of the Eucharist and washing of the feet of the disciples, but also the new commandment that he has given us, to love one another as he has loved us. John 13, verses 34 to 35. Thales's A New Commandment sets these verses to music, whereas If Ye Love Me is a setting of another related pericorp from the Farewell Discourse. John 14, verses 15 to 16 and verse 23. Both anthems are written in binary form and scored for two countertenors, tenor and bass. They are linked and tailored to the ideals of the early Anglican liturgy in several ways. First, they are written in English rather than Latin. Second, they eschew complex polyphony for simpler, more homophonic writing. The combination of both features makes the biblical text clear and understandable to the Anglophone congregants. Fittingly for music composed by a Catholic for the Anglican liturgy, If Ye Love Me was sung during Pope Benedict XVI's visit to Westminster Abbey for Evensong on the 17th of September, 2010. During Holy Week, we are called to take to heart once more the commandments that Christ gave us during his farewell discourse. Listening to these two beautiful anthems may help us in this regard. Above all, may the Lord lead us with his Spirit through this Holy Week to a deeper conversion and charity. Thank you for listening. Gain full access to our archive. Visit 5booksforcatholics.com and become a premium subscriber. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast and give it a top rating on the platform of your choice. That way more people can discover it. 
You can also support the podcast and help us produce more interviews like this one by making a one-off donation via the link given in the show notes. As little as one dollar, one pound or one Europe can help and will be greatly appreciated. Thank you once again and God bless.